Good morning and welcome to Reset 2020, to our second live show. Welcome to you all there coming in, our lovely attendees this morning. Welcome, welcome. I am your host of the show today. My name is Julia Keady. I'm the CEO and the founder of the X Factor Collective Community and we're delighted to have you here today with us on our second live show. You may have missed the first live show, which was on Tuesday, but we'll share with you a link for that recording. It was a fabulous session and no doubt we're going to have another great one here for you today as well. Uh, Reset 2020 came about because we knew that we could activate the X Factor Collective community to bring our great specialists, our subject matter specialists here for you to answer your burning questions. We, uh, alongside that, we've had our research study asking you what's going on for you and your organisation so we can respond from a programming point of view. So we've had hundreds and hundreds of organisations participate in the research and that's helped inform our programming, which we're doing in stages over the next couple of months for you and with you. So welcome there. We've got people turning up in the chat box there now. We've got people from all across Australia here today and we really want to hear who you are. So drop a note to us in the chat box there. Uh, what's your name? Where are you from? What organisation do you represent? What's the cause that you care about? What are you doing? Please drop a note in our chat box there so we can say good morning to you. Uh, we've already got people dropping a note in there. So good morning, Richard from Gippsland. Great to have you here. Please drop a note through to us here. Reset 2020 is also made possible and made free of charge uh, through our partnership with Equity Trustees. So a big shout out to our friends and partners there at Equity Trustees and the support through the Sector Capacity Development Fund. Thank you so much. Um, we are here to answer your questions today. So we have the Q&A function. No doubt you've all started to become experts in Zoom over the last couple of months um, and many other platforms. Uh, if you wanna drop your questions into the Q&A box there, just click on Q&A and please share with us your questions so we can answer as many of those for you today. We've already had quite a few questions coming in over the last couple of weeks. So Linda and Renee today have already prepared some, some content and material to share with you today as well. We are recording the event. So if you want to play back any of this later on, you'll get a link for the recording. And our partners at Pro Bono Australia will also be sharing some of the recordings in our weekly column with them as well. Uh, we'll jump into the show in just a second while I just finish off this little bit of housekeeping. If your link drops out today, your internet link, just have a look at the top of that chat box there and also on your email. You'll see some phone links there that you can dial back in on. If you're uh, coming in from overseas, there's a link there for international numbers as well. So very big welcome. We've got Kylie from Schools Plus. Good morning to you, Jane. Good morning, Luke. Lots of people coming in, Prue, Bridget, good morning, Rob, good morning, Jean, good morning, Kirsty. Great to have you here on the show today and great to hearing all the amazing organisations that you're representing there in the chat box. I'll have to keep my eyes up here and not down there. Um, but uh, we have tech support here with us as well. Jackie's on tech support. Jackie's in the chat box. If you get stuck or have any questions, please drop a note to Jackie. So here we are today talking about a very, very big topic for many of you right now. This came through strongly in our research, which was around community and corporate partnerships. It's a big part of our sector, a big part of how we run our organisations in collaboration and partnership to achieve our impact. So this was why we made it right up the front of our programming and having the program here for you today. So let me jump across and introduce you to our wonderful uh, subject matter specialist from the X, X Factor Collective here today. I'm just going to share the beautiful screen that I can see here with you. Um, very good morning to you, Renee, and good morning, Linda. Hi, Julia. Welcome to the show. Let me introduce uh, both um, our wonderful women here today to you. First of all, in your top left-hand screen is Renee. Do you want to give us a, a wave, Renee? Renee um, Hanvin is a multi-stakeholder specialist with 20 years experience in strategic leadership roles, connecting government, corporates, small to medium enterprises, nonprofits and communities for collective impact outcomes. 
Driven by the notion that doing good is good for business, Renee aspires to connect commercial priorities to social purpose needs, working with national and local brands, including Coles, Toyota, NAB, Australia Post and Scenic World Shared. As a strategist, facilitator and connector, Renee is a certified IAP2 practitioner, a member of the 2019-2020 Black Summer Bushfires Public Net Public Private Network Working Group and regularly consults to government and businesses on disaster resilience, response and recovery. Welcome to the show, Renee. Thank great, you. Great having you here with us. Also uh, here in sunny Melbourne, not so sunny today, but um, all the lighting makes it look a lot warmer than it is. <laughs> and I'll introduce you now to Linda Garnett. Hi, Linda. Give everybody a wave. Um, Linda Garnett is another specialist within the X Factor Collective uh, community. Linda has more than 20 years experience in senior leadership and strategic management roles in the corporate sector in both the UK, Canada, Japan and Australia. Linda has been responsible for billion dollar deals, new strategic direction of businesses and innovative partnerships. One day, Linda got tired of trying to buy the world and decided to save it instead. I think many of us can resonate with that. For the last 10 years, Linda has worked in the not-for-profit sector, developing shared value partnerships between charities, community groups, and the corporate sector, working with organisations as diverse as Save the Children, Headspace, World Vision, FebFast, and Cancer Council. As Director of Stellar Partnerships, Linda is passionate about achieving sustainable social outcomes through collaboration between corporates and not-for-profits. Linda's uniquely placed to bring both bring the new and commercial perspectives to partnering with the corporate sector. Welcome, Linda. Great to have you here today. Hi, everyone. Lovely to be here. Great. Excellent. As you all know, we also have Linda Smith from Beyond Blue joining us shortly, and we'll bring Linda into, um, into the show in about 10, 15 minutes. Before we do, we're actually running a live poll here today to understand what might be some of the challenges that you're experiencing with partnerships. So I'm just going to launch that there now, which you should all be able to see. Jump in and tell us what, um, what are some of the biggest challenges that you're experiencing right now? Hopefully we've got an answer on there that, is, uh, that suits your current experience. Uh, please feel free to choose more than one answer. Great to see people jumping in on that poll there now. And any questions that you have, feel free to drop those into the Q&A section there on Zoom as well. Off goes the poll and we'll check back in on the poll shortly and we will share those results with you as well. All right, so let's start jumping into it here. Uh, let's start with you, Linda, um, if we may. Uh, a lot has changed pre-COVID and now obviously with the pandemic and you've spoken to uh, 30, 40 or more organisations in the last um, recent months. Can you give us a top line view of what's changed across the landscape? Yeah, thanks, Julia. It's only been a few months, but it feels like a different universe, doesn't it? And I've talked to organisations right across the spectrum, from small to large and from across the country. And the results are actually quite surprising. You would think that corporate partnerships are an area that just went into free fall um, over recent months, but actually that's not the case. What I've seen is an enormous spectrum of responses from organizations that go, okay, my, my corporate partner is really struggling. It might be my corporate partner's virgin. So you know, I'm getting radio silence for the moment. I, I don't expect that they're going to come back anytime soon. The other organizations that have said, you know what, I've doubled my income. I'm actually getting partners coming to me and asking, what can I do for you? So I'm seeing a huge spectrum of responses. And when I look across the different fundraising streams from individual giving, events, major donors, requests, etc. I'm seeing uniform declines across the board there of about 15 to 20% in income. But what I'm seeing in corporate is really different. I'm, yes, I'm seeing some declines, maybe 15 to 20%, but I'm seeing people that have 200% ahead as well. So out of all of the fundraising streams, corporate is holding up magnificently and some corporates are really stepping up. So it's not the story that you'd expect to be. There's still plenty of really interesting stuff going on out there, Julia. 
That's fantastic. That's really encouraging. And, you know, please drop a note into the chat box for us. What's your, what's been your experience in the last couple of months as well? Please feel free to tell us. It's great to hear that partnerships are holding up, Linda, because um, you've also talked about organisations in, in a bit of a freeze response, which we'll get on to in a moment on what can you do when you're feeling a bit frozen around this area. Renee, from your perspective, your work intersects across so many sectors and you've got that really unique perspective across disaster resilience and recovery. What have you seen change across the stakeholder engagement partnerships area in this time of rolling disasters? Yeah, Julia, as you know only too well, um, for the past few years I've been connecting with corporates and governments and communities really about trying to um, drive some commitment and investment in resilience. So how we can help our communities and how we can help uh, corporates helping their customers and suppliers to get ready for the disasters ahead. Uh, and up until Christmas, you know, everyone was very much, yeah, that's, you know, that's really interesting. Um, not, not right for us. Uh, obviously, the introduction to 2020 and the bushfires absolutely catapulted that. So, so many corporates that I had connected with beforehand were literally ringing me up saying, what do we do? How do we help? And I think you can see the types of giving and the partnerships that came out of the Black Summer bushfires with the likes of, you know, um, Telstra removing phone bills from volunteer firefighters. So it was really creative. It was really innovative. Um, but it was needs based. So it's very aligned to, I guess, the, the situational needs. Um, moving into COVID-19 and it's a whole different perspective and a whole different situation because ultimately it's affecting everyone in the country. And I think the bushfire reaction um, from the corporate donations to the communities, you know, we've had them before. So it was quite easy for businesses to understand what role they could play. I think COVID-19 is a very different um, disaster type and a lot of businesses who would have had um, bushfire or natural disaster response um, strategies don't know what to do and they don't have anything for COVID. So that, that's an area that's quite been really interesting to watch. Interesting. And over the years, you've worked in the headquarters of many, many large businesses. For, for people that don't get to see that sort of uh, behind the scenes under the hood perspective. What, what's happening inside large businesses and corporations right now for them? You know, what are the internal business challenges yeah. for corporates during this time? So for corporates, it's always about balancing commercial profits and moral contribution. So the corporate social responsibility or social impact as we know, and a lot of corporates do it um, a couple of ways. So some of them have specific amounts that they allocate per year for disasters or for corporate social responsibility initiatives. And a lot of that funding is kind of set in stone. Other corporates have percentages of profits so they're reliant on what profits come. And obviously at the moment, the bushfires, but more so COVID-19, a lot of profits from organisations are absolutely going you know, backwards. So those organisations are, I guess, flurrying around a little bit to go, well, how can we continue or can we continue supporting the charities and the organisations that we have the commitments with? And if we can, we commit to them now, will we be able to next year? Whereas other organisations that have identified and have established, you know, great partnerships are absolutely thriving. So you look at the likes of Woolworths and, you know, one minute they're trying to work out how they can deliver food to people in need and then they've partnered with Meals on Wheels and our, you know, really vulnerable people are getting free toilet paper to make sure they're looked after. So it's been really, as I said, it's been really interesting to watch and there are some really great success stories. Um, but ultimately every corporate is going through a review process. You know, what does COVID-19 mean to us? and what will it ultimately mean to our partners. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. We'll hear more about this shortly as we delve into the experiences that Beyond Blue have personally had. Thanks for everyone that's jumping into the live poll there. Look forward to sharing, showing you what I can see right now on that um, in just a moment. Linda, you've seen um, organisations respond really, really well. Um, in terms of their existing partnerships, but you've also seen a lot of organisations freeze, um, which we know is a natural response in times like this. But what's needed right now for those who do have partnerships? What's needed right now from a preservation point of view? How can organisations preserve what they have in place? That's a great question, Julia. And, and there's a few key things. And I might ask you to just flip up a slide because it will be easy for people to just see and note down um, some key points there. So I might ask you to just share this photo. Um, for those of you who are not familiar and are my age, 
This is my favourite Muppet. This is Beaker. Beaker is always worried about the next catastrophe around the corner. And I chose this picture because it really encapsulated how a lot of people felt way back in February, which was the, oh my gosh, what just happened? Um, what do I do now? Um, but there are plenty of things you can do now. And I'm seeing lots of really great examples of uh, successful organizations that are doing them. So I might just quickly work through um, some key points and give you some examples of, of what's working really well for the people that are preserving their corporate partnerships. So the first one is really about nurturing relationships because partnerships really are all about relationships, aren't they? And the best thing you can do right now is contact your partners and thank them. Thank them for everything that they've done for you and ask this question, what can I do for you? Because it's really a, a wonderful opportunity when everyone is vulnerable Everyone can see the cracks and the fractures to so think about how you can actually build that relationship into something much smaller, much, much um, more, more meaningful. Um, I was chatting to the, the charity, um, a children's charity a couple of days ago, who actually said they were having uh, cold approaches come to them. And they were from people that weren't their existing partners, but had been partners maybe a few years ago. Or maybe they had discussions but didn't ever quite close out a partnership. So it's a testament to really great relationship management that they're actually coming back to them. So do nurture those relationships because it's a lot, a lot more um, profitable for you to retain your existing ones uh, rather than spend time finding new ones. So spend that time. Mm. The second bit is solve, don't sell. So people say to me, should I be having these conversations with corporate partners right now? And I say, yes, but don't be selling what you have, find solutions. So if you're asking those questions about what can I do for you, you should be asking them about what solutions can I help you provide to your problems? And I think we saw that early on when, remember the Australian Formula One Grand Prix was maybe it was going to be on, maybe it wasn't running. When they decided to pull the plug, they were left with about two weeks worth of food that was going into their hospitality they couldn't use. So they partnered with Second Bite to find a real home for that food with vulnerable people. So Second Bite became the solution to a problem that the Formula One Grand Prix had. So solutions are the way to go, not hard selling at the moment. And the third one is focusing on impact. Impact, not need. So no one really wants to know about your funding gap. But if you can talk about impact, then it opens the conversation to a much more wide-ranging discussion about value. And about value um, and way, the way you can achieve the impact that you want for your beneficiaries, for your cause, in a different way if cash is a bit tight at the moment. And I might want to give a, a huge shout out at the moment to, to what uh, the lovely guys at Lifeline Australia have done at the moment because it's all about reaching out, raising awareness about um, mental health and getting people to seek help. So their campaign, 30 Seconds to Save a Life, has been fantastic because they've reached out to corporate partners and not said, can I have cash? They've asked them to donate 30 seconds of their advertising time. So now Lifeline are getting advertising time and prime time partnered with people like Westpac, Uncle Toby's, um, uh, Seven Network and so forth which achieves what they want to achieve in terms of reaching a bigger audience, but doesn't necessarily ask them for cash to do so. So it's a great innovative solution to get the impact that you need. And on the sections around creating engagement and sharing content, there's a huge demand for meaningful and authentic engagement for staff members, uh, for volunteers, for supply networks, and I've seen anecdotal evidence from a lot of charities that their partners are coming to them saying, I've got these problems, can you help me? I need to reach out to my employees about their own well-being, or about homeschooling um, or about their mental health, for example. So a great example would be the Australian Childhood Foundation that created some really neat resources about how you as parents can talk to your children about this crisis in a really constructive way. So that's absolutely gold. So for all you charities out there, you're subject matter experts, you've got some great content, share it, offer it, and add value to those corporate partners in a new and different way. 
And in terms of rethinking events, well, Liliana on Tuesday uh, gave us some fabulous examples of how people have pivoted and thought differently about events. And it's likely that for the time being, sponsorships are going to go quiet, but you really need to rethink how you're adding value to that partner and how you're giving them a different experience of your charity, not just through event, not just through um, logos on collateral at a particular event. So, you know, if you're um, MS Research Australia, you're running a very successful May 50K um, and that's going gangbusters. If you were the million pause walk for the RSPCA, they went online um, and, and still did it virtually. So rethinking them and preserving those partnerships for the future. So those are my kind of top line things about what you should be doing right now for partnerships. That's great. Thank you, Linda. I'm sure people are busily just making some notes there. A few people commented, solve, don't sell, was something that they're going to be taking away. Love any thoughts that you have on everything that Linda and Renee have just shared with us while we get ready to bring in Linda, two Lindas now, uh, Linda from Beyond Blue. Um, also, one of the things just there on events is we have a great case study from Tuesday's live show about Guide Dogs Australia. And one of the big messages that came through was about, it's not just going to be physical events or virtual events anymore, it's this sense of hybrid events and actually how much more reach we can have now by having hybrid events into the future. So some really great content there and some great ideas for you to take perhaps into your organisations, but also to explore with your existing partners on what does this hybrid model actually mean in terms of reaching more people and having a greater impact. So just picking up on your point there, Linda, before we toodle off into the next part of our show today. So welcome if you're just joining us now, you're here on Reset 2020. This is our second live show. We've got a series of shows coming up for you over the next couple of months, thanks to our partners at Equity Trustees for helping make this um, available and free of charge for anyone around Australia to join. Um, indeed, we actually have people from across the world that have registered for the program as well. So if you're here with us today, please drop a note in the chat box. We'd love to know where you're from. It's always exciting when you see different people from different countries and different experiences as well. So now we're gonna move across into welcoming our uh, special guest today, and I'm just gonna go and find her. For those that are using Zoom at the moment, you'll understand. Um, let's have a look where you are, beautiful Linda, and bring you onto the show. Are you there, Linda? Oh, there she is, fantastic. Sorry, I always get a, a nice, pleasant surprise when that works. Um, welcome, Linda, to the show. Great to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for having me, everyone. It's great to be here. Fantastic. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to do a, a slight edit of this section uh, for our partners at Pro Bono Australia. So I'm just going to reintroduce everybody, which uh, might feel a little bit strange, but a uh, very big welcome to everyone here on Reset 2020 and introducing our subject matter specialist from the X Factor Collective. In the top left-hand corner, we have Renee Hanvin, stakeholder engagement specialist and disaster specialist as well. So someone great to speak to around uh, recovery and resilience in the disaster space. Um, Linda Garner in the top right there, corporate partnership specialist. And Linda Smith, welcome. Linda Smith is the head of partnerships at Beyond Blue. Linda's been with Beyond Blue for a couple of years now and prior to that has worked at a number of organisations including Maya Bunning, Australia, Bunnings Australia Post and Breast Cancer Network. Welcome, Linda. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here. I know you've been very, very busy over the last couple of months with Beyond Blue, such an important time and an important organisation for all of us right now. But could you share perhaps in your role there at Beyond Blue, what's something that's been a real highlight for you so far? Yeah, I think that's a great question. There's been quite a few things that have been standouts, but I think I think overall, I really feel that working with partners in this role, obviously in partnership management, who have that real genuine commitment to mental health and to our cause, um, and just seeing how passionate they are and wanting to support the work we do. And really, it's so much more than just a philanthropic type of relationship. It's a really strong, um, really strong, mutually beneficial partnership and really working together. Um, and that's been really fantastic to see. And I really feel that there's been a real shift in that in recent years in regards to the way that 
our partners want to work. Um, it's certainly moved well beyond just, um, you know, the, them getting a financial contribution from our partners and giving them our logo. Um, you know, we're really doing some amazing things with some of our partners, which is great. And the other thing that I've been really loving seeing is that um, obviously with our partners, we have the um, relationship with the partnership manager on the partner side, but seeing the passion in the other parts of the uh, partner organisation is really fantastic to see. So other parts of their organisation, people within their organisation being really passionate about the partnership. Uh, and that's been so great. And you know, we found with some of our partners that it's actually been other parts of the business that have come up with some really great initiatives that we've been able to do in the partnership. Um, and they've brought that to their partnership manager equivalent um, who then brought it to us. And it's yeah, it's just been so great to see yes. their passion and excitement. Oh, that's great. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, let's jump into... I guess some of your experiences from the last couple of months and thank you for thank you for coming on and sharing this with us today. Can you share with us what were the immediate impacts of, of COVID-19 on the organisation and, and the recent disasters as well? Yeah, look, certainly it's been a challenging time as we've all mentioned, the starting the start of 2020. Um, the recent bushfire crisis and the ongoing pandemic are definitely having a profound impact on everyone in Australia at the moment. Um, working in the mental health sector, we're seeing that a growing number of people are looking for support to cope with the widespread effects of what's currently going on. Um, so that we're finding that the pandemic is having an impact on people um, who've actually never struggled with mental health in the past, as well as those who um, have an existing mental health concern. Um, and as a result, we've actually seen an increase in demand for all of our services. Um, initially, when the pandemic first started, we saw a really big jump in calls related to the coronavirus to our support service. Um, and we actually had one in four calls related around, um, to concerns around the virus. Right. Some of the issues that people were reporting, which you probably have heard these before, um, increased loneliness, uh, the social isolation and issues around that, work anxiety, so fears around keep people keeping their jobs or having to work at home, managing children, looking after family, um, loss, and, uh, sorry, job loss and unemployment. It's obviously, we've seen how um, that's had a huge impact in, in the recent months. Um, and then family stress and relationship breakdowns. Right. Uh, so what we've done at Beyond Blue, we've um, now set up a dedicated coronavirus mental wellbeing support service. And that's to give uh, people a specific place to go um, for information and support around the pandemic. Um, so that service is available by phone. Um, and I'll, I'll just say the number because it's available for everyone. So it's 1-800-512-348. Um, and we've also got a dedicated web website at coronavirus.beyondblue org.au uh, and this has information that's been constantly updated as the pandemic evolves and we really encourage everyone to really go and visit the website because um, really I think it's having an impact on everyone so um, and really useful information. Um, we've also seen workplaces reach out to us because you know work the nature of work has changed, changed dramatically over the past few months. Mm. Um, and this has obviously impacted our partners too. So, you know, more people are having to work from home. Businesses have had to stand down staff or reduce staff hours. Um, and as a result, um, a lot of workplaces are coming to us asking for some support. And we also have uh, quite a bit of information that we've developed um, to support uh, businesses and people um, in that. Um, Great, fantastic. And, yeah. And oh, thank you. Oh, Sorry, when you, when you finished that one, I was going to say, could you t can you go no, sort of a little narrower now in terms of what might have been some of the, what have been some of the impacts around donations, partnerships, that, that whole area that you oversee? Yeah, definitely. Great. Um, with our existing partners, um, you know, they've all been impacted in different ways, depending on how the pandemic has impacted them. Um, so, for example, one of our partners has had to stand down their whole partnerships team Another one of our partners has had to stand their, down their whole workforce as a result of the government mandated stand downs, uh, shut down, sorry. Um, we've had other partners who've really reached out to ask for help to support for the mental wellbeing of their staff. And then others who were after information for um, to help their audiences and their customers. Um, so they've all been impacted differently. Um, and we found that um, at the moment they're all still connected very much within um, the partnership with us. So 
Um, the ones that have um, really had to stand down their workforce have gone quiet, but that doesn't mean that we're still not in contact with them. You know, sure. we're obviously understanding and respecting what they're going through, um, but still really wanting to be there and wanting to support them during this time. Um, and also we had another partner too, who's really been impacted. Um, they, they've kind of fed back to us. Their, their focus is uh, primarily in regional areas and they've fed back to us that it's actually the drought and the recent bushfires that have actually had more of an impact than the pandemic. Um, and so, you know, it's really important for us to all remember that it's coming, you know, the pandemic has come off those devastating bushfires and it's really important that, you know, we remember that those communities are still struggling. Mm. So they're also, um, you know, really um, conscious of that and really wanting to provide support out to all of those communities too. Great. And for those that are listening in who might not be aware of the types of partnerships that Beyond Blue have, mm -hmm. can you run us through some of the different types of organisations that you do have partnerships with? Yeah, sure. Um, so we've got um, a wonderful partnership with Southern Cross Stereo. So we're into our second year of partner partnering with Southern Cross Stereo, and they've been providing uh, in-kind support um, by providing advertising support for us, so primarily through radio. Um, and that's been a wonderful partnership for us because it's enabled us to really get our messages and our um, information out to a really wide audience. Um, so the types of things we've been doing through them is our campaign. So we have an anxiety campaign that um, they've been running for us. And that's really great because it's really helping to really increase the awareness of what we're doing and also ensuring that people know how to get the support they need and that um, it's okay to reach out for support. Um, so that's been incredibly powerful. Um, we've had a partnership with Qantas. So obviously they've been impacted with the recent pandemic. Um, that's been an in-kind partnership too. And it's part of that partnership. They've been wonderful in um, enabling us to show some of our campaigns um, in flight on the in-flight inter entertainment. So that's been incredibly valuable for us because, um, you know, our vision, we want um, all people in Australia to achieve their best possible mental health. So by sharing our information out through their channels, that's really helping us to achieve that objective. Um, we're entering a partnership with Australia Post at the moment, and that's going to be an amazing partnership. Um, again, you know, really, um, really committed to the partnership. Um, all of our partners um, really uh, have um, really passion for what we're doing and really want to get behind the cause and really support what we're doing. Um, yeah. That's great. So when, when all of this hit over the last couple of months, can you give us a sense of what you saw from your corporate partners? Did some of them go quiet for a while? Did some of them jump straight in and ask you what you needed? What, what was sort of some of the experiences you had there? Well, I think what happened was initially, like we were very conscious of what was going on with the partners. So we actually reached out to our partners um, proactively. Um, nurturing the, part, re the relationship with our partners is fundamental to what we do um, in our partnership. Um, so really it was just an extension of that. Um, and we really wanted to just see how they were going um, and find out what we could do to support them. Um, so um, obviously through that, we got quite a bit of feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, As I mentioned, some of them have had to shut down. Um, and those ones have gone a bit quieter, but we are still working with them. And then we had others like, you know, um, Southern Cross Australia who wanted to find out how they could support us and support the cause and, you know, use their channels and um, their reach to get messages out to as many people as possible, really to support, the, you know, the Australian public so that, you know, people knew where to get the support they needed. Because, you know, during these times, it's, it's you know, really important that people know that support is available. Um, we also had our CEO and our general manager call all, all of our partners to check in on them. Um, and that really, you know, we really demonstrated to our partners that, you know, we really do value the partnership. Um, and again, this wasn't something that was just out of the blue because, you know, we've made sure that we've established relationships at different levels with our partners. Um, and so, you know, for the, our CEO, our general manager to call them, it's not the first time they've ever spoken to them. So it wasn't just a random call out of the blue. Um, and then from there, we've, you know, really worked with them and finding out what they need and how we can support them. So really our focus was all about that. Um, so, you know, we've, um, work with them on how we can support their staff during this time. And, you know, as I mentioned, all of our partners have been impacted differently. Some have actually had to completely stand down all of their staff. 
and so you know really talking that through with them and providing information um, others are really busy at the moment so it's also providing them that support um, so yeah just really tailoring it too so not having like one kind of cookie cutter response for all the partners just speaking to them in uh, directly and finding out what they need Great, fantastic, excellent. Well, let's jump across into some of the things that are starting to come through, some of the, the successes that you've been having as well of late. I think this is the, uh, the inspiring part of the Reset 2020 program is mm. everyone being able to be encouraged by the, you know, the successes that people are having and the reinventions that are happening. Can you share with us today um, a couple of those highlights um, in turn, a little bit of detail around what those what those successes and what those new partnership aspects are. Yeah, so um, when the COVID-19 hit, we were actually in the process of finalising a partnership agreement with one of our partners. Um, and like every other business, their operations have been impacted. Um, we'd actually already worked with this partner on some trial initiatives in, whilst we were negotiating the partnership um, over the previous 12 months. Um, and as a result of that, as I, um, we'd established multiple points of value for both parties within the partnership. So as I mentioned earlier, that was really great because it meant that we were able to um, have different, different points of um, contacts within the organisation, which enabled uh, um, stakeholders within their business to be invested in the partnership, which is really important. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually seen in past partnerships, um, where the relationship has been built with just the one person on the corporate side. Um, and when that company left, sorry, when that person left the company, the partnership actually fell completely apart because there was no one else in the corporate that was invested in that partnership. So I'd really strongly um, suggest that, um, you know, it's a really good idea to build those relationships at different levels and different touch points within your corporate partner um, because it's just a great way to really engage um, multiple stakeholders in the partnership. Um, so what we found with this partner was that, you know, we'd already, um, well, the first thing was we created, a, we went into the partnership knowing it was a genuine alignment. And as I mentioned earlier, that's really critical. Um, so for them, like it wasn't just around giving us some financial support. It was really a lot about that, um, that objective of supporting the mental health um, mental health of everyone. Um, and so that, there was really strong mutual benefits of the partnership that we developed. Um, we'd also, and because of that, when the pandemic hit, um, we were actually really fortunate to be the only charity partner that they've actually continued to support in the current environment, um, which is really, um, you know, really wonderful for us. Um, I think the coronavirus pandemic has really demonstrated that that genuine alignment um, is so important um, because if partners didn't see the benefit of the partnership at, the, at those different levels, um, then I think we would have been at a really great risk of being let go in the current environment sure. um, because, you know, companies are obviously looking where they can cut costs. So um, often the, you know, the charity... Um, aspects of their business are the first things to go. So yeah. it's really important that, you know, you can demonstrate that there's strong value to the business and the corporate. Um, and we also had a few of our existing partner contracts ending around the time the, um, the pandemic end, uh, was hitting. Okay. Um, and I'm happy to say that also because of the, the strong relationships that we do have with our corporate partners, that actually all of our partners continued um, at the same level of support, which has been fantastic for us. That's great. Very, very encouraging to hear for sure. One of the questions that's come through here as well, Linda from Richard, has what's been the impact on Beyond Blue's um, donations, existing mm -hmm. donations to the organisation? Slightly, slightly different area of partnerships, but can you speak to that at all? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, look, we've definitely, um, whilst we've seen a massive demand for our services, the vital funding we do, have, we do receive from the community has fallen, like I think most others have experienced, um, and really primarily due to the cancellation of fundraising events um, and initiatives related to the social distancing reg, uh, sorry, regulations. Um, so, yeah, we've certainly had that impact, absolutely. Um, I think, fortunately, in partnerships, we haven't, we haven't really, like Linda said, we haven't really been too badly impacted. However, certainly we've seen that on the fundraising side to a degree. Yeah. Okay, great. Excellent. 
Um, Linda Garnett, uh, at this point in time, I know from running a small organisation in the past myself, I'm sitting here thinking, I wish I was beyond blue with big teams and having these type of partnerships. Maybe we might just take it some reflection here for those that are sort of a smaller organisation um, where it might be the CEO that's looking after partnerships, um, don't have a dedicated resource. Are partnerships still relevant for small organisations and what are you seeing for small organisations? Yeah, they're, they're absolutely still relevant and there's some great examples, uh, especially during the bushfire time where the smaller organisations were really extremely active. Uh, I remember talking to the CEO of, of Mighty Ten and all of their members, as they call them, which are individual franchises, were talking about how each franchise was really getting to grips with um, you know, the issues of bushfires and, and the needs in their community. So I remember there was a Mitre 10 out in Bensdale, Victoria, that was hosting the Gippsland fire relief um, effort and uh, helping them with logistics, doing the packing, using their, um, using their locations, and then all their tradies and their tools were going off to try and help rebuild people's houses. So um, it's not just big organisations, it's smaller ones as well. But there are some, some key things, as, as Linda said, you know, strategic alignment is going to be really important. So you know, can you answer, answer the question if you're approaching a new corporate partner about um, what is the impact we're going to have together? And why are you talking to me? Versus um, I have need and so therefore I'm kind of going out to a mass broadcast info at bank.com to see who might respond. And you've noticed probably in the last few weeks that people being shut down in their homes means that a lot of people are shopping locally and thinking more narrowly about their community and wanting to be connecting with them. So for the smaller businesses and the SMEs, that's absolutely critical because they have a really meaningful and authentic footprint in their local community. And for the larger ones, they'd really love to have that. They actually want to show their commitment to community uh, in a meaningful way as well. So I'd say to the smaller organisations, you don't have to be beyond blue, but you do have to be ready and you do have to be able to answer some really key questions about why you're aligned and what sort of outcomes can you achieve together for your cause, for the community and for the wider benefit. Fantastic. And later on in the show as well, not later on, we're not here for that much longer really, but in the next sort of 15 minutes or so, uh, we are going to address the question which came through quite strongly in our research was around looking for new partnerships and uh, that whole sort of partnership acquisition space. Linda's going to speak to that shortly as well if that's a burning question for you right now. We'll have some material there. We also have a video library of 100 free videos um, that we've developed at the X Factor Collective. So we're going to be sharing some specific videos from that video library with you after the show as well on those specific questions. I'm just going to wrap up the live poll here. If anyone wants to jump in and have their contribution in the next uh, 30 seconds or so, that would be great. The, the big one that's coming through on the live poll is there that 51% are concerned about less cash in corporate budgets. That's the biggest challenge and concern right now coming through on the uh, live poll. Um, uh, Linda, both Lindas, what are you seeing in terms of that? Just let's address that while we see it here on the live poll. Less cash in corporate budgets. What do you expect in this area? Or what are you seeing as well? Uh, oh, do you want me to go first? Um, I think that uh, Prior to COVID-19, you know, we'd obviously been looking at our strategy and thinking about potential partners we could look at approaching. Uh, and that's all different now. Like, I think it's completely um, changed. I think there's definitely opportunities out there. I think it's about really thinking about, um, really, really thinking about alignment to your organisation and which organisations at the moment um, are looking, um, looking okay in the current environment. Like, I think that's really important because I don't, you know, I think you've got to really take into consideration what's going on with the corporate side. Um, and what we've actually found too is some organisations that you think would actually be going okay, maybe aren't going as okay as you might have expected, yet others actually that you think might not be are actually going okay. So I think it's really doing your research. Um, I think it's definitely, um, definitely, 
opportunities out there. And I think, yeah, really just, just really understanding what your value proposition is and what you've got to offer is really important. And then having those conversations. Um, and like Linda said, not just mess, you know, sending mass emails, emails out, just really having those conversations and finding out what, I suppose, finding out what, what are the pain points of the organize, of the businesses at the moment and how can you potentially help them with that? Um, and I think that's a really nice conversation starter as opposed to ringing up and just asking for funds up front. Um, yeah, fantastic, excellent. Linda Garnett, do you have a reflection on that in terms of that? And I've shared the live poll results with everyone there. Hopefully you're all able to see that, uh, those results. Um, and I told a white lie, actually the red line there where and how to find new partners was the biggest challenge. Um, so that's at 63%. But just in terms of that less cash question, Linda, what's your thoughts on that? But that's, um, that's completely understandable um, at the current time. And it's probably a mirror image of what happened after the GFC in 2008. Um, immediate cash budgets were a little bit tighter and the competition um, for, the, for those budgets was uh, a bit more fierce. But some organisations are really thriving out there. Um, do you want to try and pick a winner? I'm not sure. Um, given how much my family has eaten during the lockdown, I think um, my money would be on Weight Watchers or Light and Easy, quite frankly, coming out of this this, um, this lockdown, because we're definitely going to be needing it by Christmas. But some are really thriving. So don't be afraid to look for those opportunities. But cash may not be the first point, but that doesn't mean that cash is not there. So think about how you can achieve what you want to achieve, whether it's you know, for Beyond Blue, it's about reach and impact and getting your message out there. If someone had given you a million dollars and just dropped it in a bag on your lap, what would you do with it? And would it be better to actually go, you know what, a partner can provide bigger channels, bigger audiences, um, different ways of connecting with the audiences, and I can actually achieve that in a different way. Um, there's a wonderful organisation, I know that uh, Jean is on the line on the chat as well, called No to Violence, which deals with uh, male perpetrators of family violence. And they've created a great partnership uh, with Unimel and with NAB to create a website called The Better Man, which drives men to actually seek help earlier uh, when they can see themselves going that, down that path and, and um, falling into the trap of family violence. And now that's a great way of achieving the organization's mission, but they don't necessarily need cash or just cash. Great. So as I said earlier, if you have a conversation around value and impact then the cash comes, it just may not necessarily the leading point at the moment. Yeah. Fantastic. I think with that too, like we've actually had examples of a partner who is actually producing some video learning content for us. Um, and that's something that was in our budget to pay for ourselves, but we actually found a partner to help us do that. So by reducing the cost, it's also, you know, it's almost the same as getting the revenue in because you, you are saving that money. It's just in a different way. So there's lots of opportunities to think about different ways of how you can connect with partners out there. Fantastic. Excellent. Now, Renee Hanvin, over to you. Love your reflections here. Over the years, I've um, loved the term that you say token is broken. And there's certainly been a few examples given um, just now of uh, non-tokenistic partnerships. Can you uh, reflect on everything that's being said here around Beyond Blue's engagement activity and what really stands out for you? Yeah, I think Linda Smith has um, given a great overview in terms of good practice engagement um, and collaboration between stakeholders. It definitely has to be a win-win. So there's got to be value on both sides. The big thing for me, um, particularly in the disaster space is you've got to have um, the partnerships have got to be authentic so you really need to it needs to align with the strategic vision and the priority and the focus for the um, giver and the receiver because token is broken um, and there's been great examples and I'm not going to name and shame but there have been really clear examples of reactive giving or reactive partnerships or reactive goodwill to communities relating to the bushfires predominantly do you kind of question, it's like, mm, okay, I see what you're trying to do. You've got yourself in the media, so you've got your PR around it, but really what impact or what outcome is going to come from it? So I think that's, you know, if you are going to look for new partnerships or if you want to talk to your existing partnership, absolutely think 
more than cash because the cash part is the easy part. There is so much more that can come, which is much more valuable, but also make sure that it's not just, you know, a perceived good idea by you that actually is probably going to be impactful or harmful for those that you're trying to help. Fantastic. And stay on the show with us as well. Renee Hanvin has a great um, hat, hat trick um, uh, later for us, but she's going to show you a stakeholder engagement activity that you can run with your team. Uh, you can do it virtually. Um, that's, that's how we're all doing everything now at the moment, but um, some activities that you can run with your team, um, with your volunteers as well, to actually think a bit more broadly and creatively around your stakeholder engagement. So stay on the line with us. Um, look forward to seeing Renee's, um, I keep calling it the hat trick, but um, it's an activity and a tool that you'll be able to use. That's great. Um, Linda Smith, coming back to, you talked a lot about good relationship management and I, I think that point that you made before about those different points in the organisation of your organisation, having those connections with your partners, the general manager getting on the call and, and others getting on and making calls at this time and, and that really solid relationship management being key. What do you think, other than that, have been the keys to Beyond Blue's um, success in, in preserving and, and enhancing these relationships at this time? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think just prior to the COVID pandemic, um, we'd actually put in place a partnerships framework. So, and that was really great because it actually really helped clearly define for us what we were doing. So we started off by actually defining what a corporate partnership is. And that was really important because it really defined, really made it clear to us that, you know, it really was around that finding um, partners that um, deliver mutually beneficial outcomes for both parties um, and, you know, achieving both organisations as a strategic objective. So really moving away from that philanthropic model. Um, we then defined our assets. So we did lots of workshops across our organisation internally, really to find out all those hidden assets that um, are hiding in the corners that you don't really think of that could be, you know, really beneficial for partners and engage different stakeholders in the business. And that also helped engage them in doing partnerships and getting involved. Um, and really having that clear list of assets was really helpful for us too, because then we're, when we're looking at partners and who we could potentially partner with we can look at what they might be interested in and what could really benefit them and what we've got to offer mm -hmm. um, and yeah we, we did things like we put in place um, a criteria for selecting partners so we don't have a lot of partners so you're probably surprised if you go to our website you know we've only got really a handful but the partners really our strategy is we've got fewer strategic partners that make big impact rather than lots of small little ones. And that's really important for us. Um, and we really value and nurture our partners, which I think we've talked about already. Um, and when we look at a you know, potential partner bringing it on, even in this environment, so that hasn't actually changed, we, we ask ourselves, does it make sense for Beyond Blue to partner with this organisation? And what are the synergies? Um, how, how would this partnership help us with our strategic objectives? Um, what are, what are those opportunities beyond that in-kind or, or financial support? Um, can we use their channels? Um, we look at all of that thing when we're considering a partner. And why do they want to partner with us? So, you know, that's really important for us because, you know, we wouldn't want to partner with an organisation that wasn't... Um, wasn't dedicated to good mental health practices with their staff, for example. So we would not want to partner with organisations like that. So that's really critical for us. Um, you know, it's not just about that brand alignment. We're not really looking at partners for that. Um, and then also we really look at what resources are required from Beyond Blue to service a partner. And that's really important too, because, um, you know, there's no point bringing on this amazing, huge partnership if you can't actually deliver on that partnership. Um, because, you know, partners do take time. Like, if you're going to do partnerships properly, they do take time. Um, so that was really important for us to identify those things and be really clear. And then we set up, we always set our partnership up for success. So we usually hold a planning meeting with the partner. We agree on objectives um, and we develop a partnership plan. And then the key is then after we've done all of that, it's about managing the partnership. So it's not a set and forget. So it's not a, uh, at the end of the partnership 12 months, we, um, you know, get out our objectives and look at them again. We always have regular monthly for us. We have monthly meetings with our partners um, and we do that. And through those meetings, we grow the relationship with the partner. Um, we are constantly looking for opportunities to identify um, and leverage the partnership for both parties. So it's not necessarily just what we initially put in because what we found is as our relationships evolve, that the partnerships always evolve. And, you know, we find all these amazing new things that we can do together. Um, 
And I think, and also acknowledging the partner is incredibly important. And what we found in the current environment is just having that solid foundation in place really has enabled us to, um, first of all, partner with the right partners for the right reasons. And this has been really fundamental in the current environment. And I think it's really gone a long way as to why we've been able to retain all of our partners in this time. Great, um, fantastic. Excellent. Um, we've got a question here that's come through on the Q&A um, from Kirsty, and it's specific to, to Beyond Blue. And hope you feel free to be able to answer this, um, Linda, in the best possible way. But the question from Kirsty is, what do partners get from Beyond Blue for their money? That's yep. the question from Kirsty. Can yep. you give us some insights there, please? Yeah. Uh, look, it really depends on the partnership and what we're both trying to achieve. So we don't just have a... Um, well, we've got our list of assets. We work with our partner to work with them to meet our mutually uh, beneficial objectives. But some of the things can be uh, like a proudly partnering partner logo, which is really valuable because, you know, that brand alignment is really important to them. Um, and we've got strong brand awareness. So being aligned to Beyond Blue is really valuable. Um, one of the key things that we find our partners are really interested in is our evidence-based mental health information. Right. So that's, um, you know, we work with them depending on the level of partnership. Sometimes we'll come up with some content together with them using our information and their information that could be shared out through their channels. So that's really valuable um, information that they want. Um, we've got lived experience speakers. So they're people who have been um, uh, experienced a mental health condition. Um, and so they're really also really valuable. So we, our speakers go out to different um, events and workplaces and just talk about their own experiences. And that's incredibly powerful um, and a really important program that we run at Beyond Blue um, because it allows um, people to hear um, the experiences of somebody else that, that they, they themselves may have also experienced. And it's really important for reducing stigma. And we, we do find that um, our speakers are in high demand, mm -hmm. uh, particularly around World Mental Health Month. Um, yeah, it's really, really challenging to get one of our speakers because they're already booked up. Um, so they're just, I suppose, you know, we've got right. like, a whole range of assets that we do provide, but they're probably some of the key ones. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Kirsty, has that been helpful for you, that question and the answer that uh, Linda's just provided there? Drop into the chat box, Kirsty, and let us know if that's been helpful. Um, there's definitely some ideas there that I hadn't thought about in terms of speakers and that sort of evidence-based material. I'm sure that might be something that you can all be um, thinking about today. What else do we actually have? What are we sitting on? What is this mountain of value that we can actually bring out um, through our partners? So thank you very much for sharing that, Linda. Linda Garnett, we're going to wrap up this session in just a, se in just a, se uh, a second. Um, can you give us some final thoughts, observations on, on Beyond Blue and what some of those key takeouts are that you'd like to share with other organisations? Look, it's wonderful to hear from uh, Linda Beyond Blue and um, congratulations on all the successes you're having. And some great things that we've already touched upon that I really want people to think about, which is around that strategic alignment, alignment around values, around outcomes, um, because it's not just about this, this kind of um, cheap philanthropy, as I call it, is definitely under pressure. The ones where you just had a good relationship with someone in uh, an, an influential position and they um, found some money for you. Now it's really going to be about strategic alignment. Mm -hmm. And I heard yesterday that Coles supermarkets uh, were about to renew, um, renew and review a whole bunch of their existing partnerships. And their aim is, as a result of it is not to spread themselves as thinly, mm -hmm. but actually concentrate on the really strategically aligned relationships and go deeper. So I expect to see some changes there. And I wouldn't be surprised if a few other organisations are doing the same. And one of the things that's changing the environment at the moment is really being driven by consumer behaviour and beliefs that are changing. And there's a couple of really great pieces of research by the Edelman Trust Barometer and by McKinsey, which talk about the changes in consumer behaviour. And a couple of those stats really um, spoke out to me. Um, one which basically said 89% of consumers expect a corporate to show that they're helping during this crisis. Mm. And 65% said they would change their purchasing behaviour as a result. And even more sort of, um, you know, an alarm bell for corporates, which is one in three have already punished brands that did not respond well. 
Really? Wow, that's high. So corporates are really uh, having to step up and go, we really need to demonstrate our social purpose. We need to demonstrate our, not just our alignment to a cause, but our commitment to community, whether that's a local community in your high street, uh, in Bensdale, Victoria, in Wagga Wagga, wherever that is. But more generally, are we actually helping the community during a really difficult time? So just remember as consumers, you have power and it, it's really shaping the way that corporates are responding. So I'd say there are opportunities, as Dion Blue has shown, but what you actually need to do is get organised, get systematic about it, be really strategic, get your own internal ducks in a row and position yourself better because the market undoubtedly will be more competitive in the future. That doesn't mean there are not opportunities. There are some great ones. They're likely to be bigger and richer ones. But you actually need to get yourself organised, get a system and a framework in place before you go out there and before a well-meaning board member sends you one of those little post-it notes going, here's the ASX top 200, why don't you just start with A and work your way through to Z, um, you'll be able to tell them why that's not the case and why you're making much more informed and strategic choices about your new partners. Yeah, great one, Linda. And someone's just popped a note there saying it'd be great to have access to that consumer behaviour report as well, which is that sharing that evidence back internally, showing people what what the changes are there. So we can definitely get that link from Linda and share that with you after today's session. Um, we're going to say goodbye to Linda Smith now. Uh, we're going to stay on the line. We've got more questions here coming through to answer. Um, I've got a question here about the different ways that we can support our partners. What are the ways to give back to the givers? Uh, we've got a question here about social procurement and partnership development. So we'll jump onto those questions for you shortly as well. So if everyone can just help me uh, do a virtual round of applause with uh, for Linda Smith from Beyond Blue for coming on the show, jump into the chat box. What's one thing that Linda has shared with you today that you're gonna take away from the session today? Everyone's jumping in there now. Thank you very much. Some brilliant ideas, Linda, and suggestions to practice with partners. That's it. Go off and experiment on those lovely partners of yours. Uh, this is a time for innovation. This is a time to be able to say, let's have those conversations about what we can do together and no ideas are off the table. Um, so, you know, be brave. That's one of the big messages that's been coming through on the live shows so far. Thank you. Look at those, those beautiful messages there. Solving problems, not selling. Thank you very much. Great, great that that's been helpful for you all today. We've loved having you on the show, Linda Smith. Thank you so much for going, uh, taking us under the hood of Beyond Blue. It's always interesting and intriguing to actually see some of the most love, some of the organisations that we love um, in our country, and actually going behind the scenes and seeing how it actually works. So it's lovely to have you here. We we hope we can do some more with you into the future. Oh, that would be wonderful. And thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. I've loved it. Fantastic, excellent. So we're just going to pop you off there to the side now. Just uh, there we go. Thank you very much. Very good, excellent. Well, great to have your um, your all your comments there. I'm just going to jump over and have a look. Thanks, Linda. Amazing work and partnership ideas, finding shared objectives. Great. Loved the concept of speakers contributing their lived experience to partners. So hopefully you're all uh, learning learning here from uh, everyone on the screen, but also everyone in the chat box there as well. There's been some beautiful ideas shared in the chat box there, and that is indeed what we're all about. The X Factor Collective was put together to actually see if we could uh, improve well-being of change makers. That's what we're all about, is uh, could we actually create a community and could we uh, create interventions like this? Could we do programming? Could we actually make life easier for you to get access to support and advice to feel less isolated in achieving the change you want to achieve? So part of uh, the X Factor Collective was could we actually make a bit of a one-stop shop of pre-vetted specialists who you could come and connect with at any given time as well? So we're really proud. We've got about 55 businesses across Australia who are part of the collective and, and we're growing. We've got some amazing new businesses who all have a focus on social impact and the not-for-profit sector joining the collective over the next year. So we really want to be there for you whenever you have questions, challenges, whether it's uh, HR or IT or marketing or comms, whatever it might be, that we've got someone here within the collective who can support you and work in a very integrated and holistic way with you. So just before we jump onto those next questions, I'm just gonna show you a couple of things that we've been putting together 
for for uh, for you all. One of them is um, a platform that we've been investing in over the last 12 months where you can actually come on. It's the first of its kind in Australia just to be able to um, search for a specialist across a number of different filters. Um, if you can't find the, the person that you're looking for through, through the platform, we have a concierge uh, help desk service that we'll be growing with partners um, over the next 12 months as well. And that's a really lovely service where you can actually come have a conversation, um, talk about the things that you might need in your organisation as well, take a longer horizon view as well, and we can talk about some of the different solutions and services that are available in, in Australia. Um, and we do get a unique perspective because a lot of those businesses and suppliers are here in the collective as well. So we can share that knowledge with you and help you find uh, the most appropriate support that you need. Um, so let's jump back into some more questions um, here as well. Great, um, it's uh, 12.06. We're going to be here for about another 20 minutes. So if there's anything that's burning for you right now, please jump them into the Q&A section there so we can um, sort those out for you today. Before we jump into a couple of those questions, I did reference before about the hat trick um, that uh, Renee is going to share with us now. Renee, you've got some tools that organisations can use to get creative at this time. Could you share some of that with us now? Yeah, sure. I should have actually bought them. I feel bad now. I didn't think of that. Um, so obviously my whole focus with everything is about stakeholders because um, as you're creating the strategy or potential partnerships, the more you can know about and identify the stakeholders that it would be directly or indirectly relevant to, the better outcome you potentially have. So stakeholders are obviously all the different audiences that are associated, associated with your business. Now about, I reckon it's about 20 years ago, I, I ran a PR agency with an advertising agency and all of our um, creative brainstorming was around the six hats approach. And the six hats approach is basically each hat has a different color and each color represents different feelings or emotions. That's not what my uh, red hat, black hat is, but it's an evolution of that. So basically, um, I've, I've evolved that to be every stakeholder group has a type of hat or a colour hat. So you basically identify all the stakeholders that are relevant to your organisation. So your shareholders, your um, employees, your partners, your uh, recipients, your suppliers. There's a whole myriad of stakeholders that every organisation um, needs to know. And you basically give them a colour. So I always give um, the shareholders the black. They have the black hat because shareholders obviously want to be in the black. They don't want to be in the red. I give media because media is a stakeholder that you absolutely must have with any kind of program or, or initiative, you know, that you're thinking of that might be um, great for your brand or your business. So I give them the red hat because media can be really awesome and great in terms of getting you front page news, but media can be that fire that just sits in the background that can actually turn your idea or concept into a crisis. So a great thing to do is basically map out all the different audiences or stakeholder groups, give them a color or give them a type of hat. And then I do sit by myself very regularly, although I don't quite put the hat on anymore, but it's a really fun activity. You could do virtually and get anyone to put, you know, bring a hat from home, show a hat from home, or um, sit in a group if, when you get back into the office. And when you're coming up with a, a creative idea or a concept or a potential partnership initiative or a fundraising initiative, put all the hats on and think to yourself, right, would this stakeholder hat like this concept? What would they like about it? What would they not like about it? So you kind of do a bit of a SWOT analysis per stakeholder. And that's really going to help you identify how you should or could engage with those stakeholders. So you might go, so we have this concept, we have this particular idea. Now the board, I know, will really, so the black hat, the board will love that idea because that was in the strategic priorities that they just approved. So we're going to go yay on that but they're probably not going to like that part of it because that is a bit new or it's a bit risky or et cetera, et cetera. So it's quite, so, so there's no link I can send you to, but you can jump on the X Factor website if you want to find out more and look me up. But it's a really fun way to identify, get to know your stakeholders better and then understand how you can engage with them more, which is going to um, expand your existing or future partnerships and just relationships. Great, excellent. And actually getting into that feeling space, which sometimes gets overlooked, I guess. We get stuck up here in our head and forget um, to activate, you know, how does it actually feel for the partners? Yeah. How does it 
feel- hundred percent. And also like I'm, everything I do is needs based and everything in the disaster space is needs based. So absolutely you need to um, activate impact, but you, you know, there's no point in uh, um, activating impact for something that's not needed. And this is really fundamental. And it's a real problem in the disaster resilience and recovery space as well. We need to know, not perceive, but we need to know what communities or what um, various organizations actually need. And then you can activate partnerships or solutions that fulfill those needs. And again, so many organizations stick to the same stakeholders. It's the traditional ones they feel comfortable with, they know. Do the red hat, black hat exercise and Google all types of stakeholders and see all the ones that you're currently not talking to or not engaging with because they will open doors of opportunities that you never even knew. And that's relevant for the good times and the bad. That's a great segue into um, Linda's next uh, information that she's going to be sharing. And it's certainly come up in the poll here today is where and how to find new partners. I guess part of that is actually getting innovating and innovative and creative, knowing that having new partner conversations, they actually want to hear from you about what this, what you know, where you've been able to creatively and innovatively think about all of their stakeholders as well. So maybe we might jump across into that next, and then we're going to come back to a couple of these questions. Linda, can you share with us? Um, the whole space of looking for new partnerships and partner acquisition space. What's what are your what's your advice and what's the structure that you give for people to actually start that journey? That's great, and I had great, a great example that uh, that yeah, Linda Smith shared about the process that Beyond Blue uh, went through. Because we talk about seven steps, and the first one's really understanding partnerships and understanding all the range of different types of partnerships, and not just you. Uh, that might actually wear a hat that says partnership manager, but your whole organisation, because it really does take a whole village. You know, as Renee said, you know, lots of different stakeholders um, to work on partnerships. And the second bit is really evaluating what are the right opportunities for you. So what's right for Beyond Blue may not be right for you as a smaller community organisation. So let's think about what fits for you. And the third step is about understanding your offering part of which is understanding, do you have something to offer? What do you want to offer? What's on the table, what's not on the table? And who might be interested in that? So it might be um, you have a particularly niche audience or you've got a really authentic voice with something or you've got some absolutely you know, crazy, brilliant ambassadors. So what are your particular assets that are going to be attractive to other people? Equally important as that is understanding how to manage the risk around partnerships, which is about making choices about your go and no-go areas as well. And don't be having those discussions around a board table when you've just started prospecting. Have them way before then, because I've seen organisations that go round and round for six months um, with something as simple as like, you know, do we partner with a company that does bottled water? Yes, it's about water and not soft drink. No, there's a terrible um, environmental impact through plastic. So make those choices about your no and no-go area way up front before you start prospecting, because that will just narrow the choices and mean, and mean that you, you make much better ones and be more targeted about the partners. And then the, the next step really is about making sure you've got your pitching and your collateral right. So it's about how you talk about your organization. Are you clear about where you're going and what you're about and where, you, where your dreams are, what your aspirations are? Because dreams are really seductive to a corporate partner. It's not so much what I'm doing today and why you could fund what I'm doing today, but more where am I going? What am I going to achieve? What's the exciting thing I can buy into? And the sixth step is really about nurturing those relationships, which is what Beyond Blue have done really well over time. They've invested in it. They've had the monthly um, um, catch-ups. They've had uh, organization points uh, all the way from the CEO down to really invest in nurturing the relationship. And then the final point is thinking about how you can take that from good to great. So how can you take an, uh, a partnership that maybe started in one area? It might be cash. It might be some goods. It might be just a promotional partnership. How do you actually extend that and find all these other points of integration that make a really, really sticky partnership that would be really hard for you both to unwind even if you, even if you wanted to. So that will sustain you through time. 
can you pick a winner at this point in time? Well, it's really hard to say. Sometimes, um, I think as Renee mentioned, you know, they're not the obvious ones. I remember after the, the GFC in 2008, one of my best performing corporate partners was a small organization that made security shutters. You know, the ones that you see when shops sort of pull down their, their doors for the night? They were going gangbusters and I hadn't expected that, but um, they were sort of doubling, trebling their profits. And so they came on board and say, what else can I do? So it may not be possible for you to pick the winners. You could see obviously the ones that are struggling, you know, whether they're Virgin or Qantas for the time being, doesn't mean that they'll always be struggling though. So bear that in mind. Mm. But if you're really clear about your proposition, what you've got to offer and who's the right fit, then you'll be able to find those right opportunities. Great. Fantastic, Linda. Excellent. That's the seven steps. Hopefully everyone was busily taking notes, but there will be a recording. Don't worry. You can rewatch this again and go through those one by one. Just that one part on assets. I've seen Linda do this many a time. That one part on assets is just a whole big chunk of its own and so, sometimes very much overlooked, isn't it, Linda? Um, and and often people don't... Um, don't consider some of their assets real assets either, which is leads into a question that we've got here from tomorrow today. And that is, do you have any tips about the different ways to support our partners? Um, what are the ways to give back to the givers? And the Renee, I might see if you both have some ideas there on, on, on supporting partners. Yeah, I, I, think, I think one organization I worked with recently, um, which worked with very sick children, looked at ways um, they could actually add value to their corporate partner when they had their um, annual conference. They had an annual conference um, with all their suppliers together. And they actually created, um, where they helped, some really neat little videos um, that said thank you. So for all the families and the sick children they helped, just really raw ones that actually enabled the corporate partner to then connect with their suppliers and inspire them. So the corporate partner then turned their annual conference into a fundraising event for that charity. So rather than just um, give their own commitment, they actually brought in their entire supply network to do so. And they did that with really great quality content. And it wasn't expensive. They didn't pay anyone to do it. They pretty much did it on their iPhones, but it was authentic, it was real, it was genuine. And that's, content is a great way in which you can add value to your partners. Gorgeous. Renee, what have you seen? Or what are some of the ideas you have? Yeah, same. I've actually seen a few organisations where um, the charity has um, activated the skills that uh, basically to give more capabilities and capacity in the corporate giver. So I guess reverse rolling kind of the help and support. So if the corporate's struggling in a particular area and the, the charitable organisation has capacity or has um, access to others. Um, also, I think it's very much about identifying, again, I go back to needs-based, like just asking, you know, your um, partners, like, what do they need? What are their pain points at the moment? Like, what's keeping them up at night? And then don't forget the feel-good factor. So you've seen the um, beautiful media with all the kids from the schools writing the letters and people leaving notes on the houses to the fireys who saved their houses. Like, there's nothing more heartwarming and appreciative than, you know, a note or, or just a thank you. So I think thinking about that real grass level, grassroots level kind of how you can, you know, just say thanks or just connect or just say, you know, how are you doing? Great, great job. We really appreciate it. So there's lots of ways. Absolutely. Um, tomorrow, today, does that help give you some ideas? Jump in the chat box and let us know. If you're sitting there thinking, I've got a bunch of ideas as well for tomorrow today on the ways they could support their partners, drop it in the chat box as well there. We're a community here helping each other, so please share. Um, we'll jump across here into another question um, around international and overseas initiatives um, in terms of corporate's interest in what's happening internationally. This is a question from Nina. Nina says, with the GFC looming, how do we create interest from corporates to support international and overseas initiatives um, as many global companies are feeling the insecurities on the financial markets as well. Um, Linda, Renee, I know you've worked on projects all around the world and Linda, you've certainly lived and worked in five different countries. What are you seeing there? What's, what do you think we might be able to do in terms of creating that interest? I might just pop in there, there Renee, for the, for the first response. Um, I've done a lot of work with international aid agencies 
And I know that some are really struggling at the moment because they can't run their programs or their services in the same way because they just can't access the communities. Um, they're in lockdown or they're, they're dealing with a whole bunch of things. So there are problems at the moment. What I've seen is um, international, the, the international call, um, a bit like some of the other ones that um, you know, are, are a bit more contentious. You've got to find your tribe. You've got to find your tribe and build it. And there's a great example uh, of an organisation that's doing it really well. In Melbourne, the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre is doing that extremely well. If you go to their website, look at their comms, they're constantly telling stories. And what they've done is they've really identified their audience that are aligned with their values and the cause. So really, if you're working internationally, you've got to find your tribe. And you've got to create that groundswell of support. So not everyone is going to be as interested in that particular cause as they might be in something else. But again, find your tribe and communicate with it authentically, continuously, tell them the stories and build that, that sort of groundswell of support and identify it. So there's a tribe out there for everyone. You've got to gather them together and communicate with them. Great, thank you. Renee, do you have any thoughts on that one there? Yeah, so I think um, basically it comes down to relevance. So a lot of, you know, corporates are going to give to what is relevant to them. So they might give to all Australians if they're based in Australia. They might give to specific regions if that's where they trade or that's where their customers are based or their employees are based. So have a think about what organisations um, have, you know, are aligned to maybe they have call centres in certain parts of the world that are being impacted, so then there's relevance. So that's the first thing. There's also a lot of the big multinationals have global corporate social responsibility funds and strategies. So the likes of Coke. So Coke's response to the bushfires in Australia has been amazing, great, like really strategic and really impactful. But they are part of an alignment of um, corporate philanthropic across lots of their lots of various continents. So they have a, a global strategy, a global strategy, and then relevant to what that is, then they activate it in the areas that they need. So again, look out for the organisations or the philanthropic groups that are all about you know global and helping the vulnerable communities, um, and then the organisations that are based in Australia that perhaps have relevance, they have customers or they have a supply chain um, that is, is overseas as well. Great advice. Fantastic. Nina, has that been helpful for you? We hope so. We can't see your face to check. Um, jump into the chat box and let us know, Nina, if that's been helpful and given you some ideas there. Um, jumping up, up here into just looking at uh, social procurement, Helen has asked, can anyone speak to social procurement in partnership development? Is that something, Linda, Renee, um, Someone jump in with some comments there. I'm not sure, Helen, exactly what you want to know. Maybe you might clarify that for us, Helen, if you're still on the line in the chat box. But Linda, Renee, social procurement and partnership development. Yeah, so social procurement is really getting a spotlight. And basically any government um, tender or um, uh, um, uh, program that you bid for or you go for has to have a social procurement element. Now, obviously, most of us are in the social impact space. So, you know, my business is purpose for, prof uh, purpose for profit. So we're all about delivering social impact. But the more you can add and the more social purpose um, value you can provide outside of the typical partnership agreement. So, for example, do you, are you able through the partnership to contribute to vulnerable groups getting employed or to um, uh, delivery of outcomes being to specific vulnerable groups that are on, you know, social procurement kind of identified lists. So as well as just thinking about, you know, what you can provide and how your direct um, charity or organisation who they serve, also think about what's important to the likes of um, the governments, um, you know, state governments different to federal governments. So, so what's on their radar from a social procurement aspect as well? Because that's like a value add, but it's actually a needs-based value add because a lot of um, uh, tenders and we've, you know, we've been going through a few recently relating to the bushfires and we have to demonstrate and there's a, a score like a five or, a five or 10 percent based on how we can deliver social procurement um, as part of our delivery of the programs. Fantastic. Excellent. Linda, do you have some thoughts there as well? Yeah, I think that there's a few organisations that are doing it quite well at the moment. So um, Brotherhood of St Lawrence are really responding to this by creating an employment services as part of their, as an adjunct to their core business. Um, Asylum Seeker Resource Centre have done similarly with a couple of social procurement um, employment uh, initiatives and also 
uh, ASRC Catering, if anyone's in Melbourne, I'd definitely recommend you go and check out that one. So it's going to be one of the key drivers uh, in future. And as governments roll out different social procurement policies and also gender plans as well, um, that will come into play as well. So don't forget that angle too. Yeah, beautiful, fantastic. We've got a couple more questions. Um, Helen, can you jump in? Yep, thanks Renee and Linda, helpful information. You're very welcome, Helen. Um, just to show you, we've got a couple more questions there as well. We've popped in the chat box some links on how to get in touch with uh, Renee and Linda as well, just so you know. Um, everyone in the collective, and we've got more coming at the moment, have their own profile page, um, and you can jump in and have a look. Um, sometimes what we find is people get overwhelmed by, well, you know, this is going to cost me $2,000 a day for a consultant to talk to. And a lot of our um, specialists in the collective have packaged services as well. So they've thought about what are the different price points and what are the different needs that different size organisations have. You can see there a range of different solutions that uh, Linda and her business partner Sharon have come up with, which you might want to jump on and have a look after the show. There'll be some things to support you perhaps now or into the future. Um, and the same with Renee. Renee's got some hat trick um, uh, solutions there as well. If that was something that you think might be useful to actually learn that tool, you can jump in there, um, read up a little bit more about Renee as well on that profile page. Jumping back into some final questions, we've got about three minutes uh, left of questions until we start to wrap up the show. It certainly does go quick, that's for sure. Um, Kirsty says, and this, um, this comes back to uh, new partnerships, this question uh, for, for Linda is, what's your view of going to market right now or going to community for new relationships right now? Um, my view is don't ask, don't get, but make it really strategic and be really, really clear you've done all your homework beforehand so it's not a random ask about your need or your funding gap you've got to really answer some like four key questions so who are you and what do you do and that's succinctly not in three pages what is the impact of the partnership that we could have together and why do you ask me so why have you chosen me specifically so don't be going out with anything that looks generic or a cookie cutter because that'll end up on the shredding floor. You've really got to target your, your prospecting to have you got a good answer to, for that question. Why are you talking to me? Otherwise, um, you know, it, it just won't cut through. So it's some really key simple things, but you'd be amazed how many organisations just don't do that. Mm -hmm. And having sat on the other side of the fence and also talked to a lot of corporates, they just, um, you know, I, I know one corporate that um, sent out a, a request uh, last year for new partners and they didn't go through with a single one of them because they were all the cookie cutter standard procedure proposals. So unless you're prepared to tailor it and really get into the head of your prospective partner and understand why are they the right fit and what could you achieve together? Not what can I achieve with your money, but what can we achieve in partnership together? So I'd say, yes, absolutely. Go after those new opportunities um, for the reasons that Corporates are really looking for new and innovative ways to demonstrate their social purpose credentials and also connect with their audience. But just be really thoughtful about it. Great, fantastic. And Kirsty's popped a note in there going, ooh, great. Oh, maybe it sounded like that. Um, why are you asking me? Thanks, exactly. Such a great paint, uh, point to tailor the offer. Thank you. You're welcome, Kirsty. We're delighted to be able to help you with that question today and more questions into the future. Um, everyone is starting to, I can't believe how many people have stayed here for the full 90 minutes. Um, wonderful to have you all here with us today. We've got next week a big issue that many of you have told about us uh, in the research as well was how do we get cut through at this time? Everything that we have been doing up until now is not working. People aren't getting back to us. We're not cutting through to our stakeholders anymore. And we're not getting the attention of our, you know, our media relationships and partnerships that we've had in place. We're not getting the same level of traction. So we've got um, amazing public relations specialists from the community, Jody Artis, and our brand specialist, Darren Taylor, um, coming on the show on Tuesday to talk through those issues. 
and our case study is going to be the wonderful Jason Kimberley from Cool Australia. Jason's going to be talking about all the things that he's done over the last 10 years to set themselves up to have amazing cut through at this time, 600% um, um, increase in the number of inquiries and programs that they've been able to get out there because of all the great um, foundations that they have laid. So come and hear from Jason, Jody, and Darren on our show on Tuesday. Just finally, we've got a question here. Um, Kirsty asked a question as well about the coronavirus site from Beyond Blue. Kirsty, we'll get back to you about that as well. I didn't answer that question up until now, but um, we'll get back to you about how you can have a link through from Beyond Blue's website to your website. If others would like um, more of that information about Beyond Blue's website, please let us know in the chat box and we can follow that up for you as well. Final question here, Linda, from Jackie, and it's a big question around valuing assets. How do you value your assets and isn't it dependent on the individual partner what the value your asset has to them. That's probably a whole section of its, a whole session of its own. Um, and if that's something that other people would find helpful, drop into the chat box now and tell us, does valuing your assets, is that a big issue for you? Linda, perhaps just in the last minute as we wrap up, can you share, shed some light on that for Jackie? Yeah, thanks, Julia. This is really important and it's a step that lots of organizations miss out on um, large ones and small ones and sometimes your asset um, catalog might be small sometimes it's uh, quite niche but the first thing you actually need to do is gather it and catalog it because half of what you've already got you're probably not aware of and um, what we often do with organizations is actually get your multi-stakeholders to do that but the question of value is a much bigger one and there's not an easy answer it's not a rate card uh, uh, like an advertising rate card of where you go, this is this one tweet is worth X. Because no one's interested in that. It's how you put it together. And if you think about, um, I always think the analogy of um, airlines is a great one. Um, a price is not a price for everyone. There's a package price. There's a sense of urgency if you need to travel tomorrow. There's a price for the people that need a, a holiday and a car hire in it as well. So it depends on how you package it who your target is. And so it's not um, an absolute, you know, my, my assets are worth 50,000. I'd never give someone that example. Um, but it's absolutely worth working through because you really need to know what you've got to offer a partner before you go out there. So happy to answer more questions in more detail there. But um, as you say, that's probably another hour session all by itself, Julia. Absolutely. And Jackie, do jump on to our video library, The Exchange. It's all free of charge. We're, we're wanting to grow this with partners um, over the next couple of years as well. I think there might be a video in there, Linda, that we shot with you about a, a year ago um, on assets. So jump in there and have a look and we can share those with you more widely after the show as well. We're going to start to wrap up. I'd love to hear from you before you go. Jump in the chat box and just tell us uh, what's been great about the show today? What else might you need um, that you didn't get from today? We'll also send you a feedback form, of course, to find out what else you need. Um, and what's been a key takeaway for you today? Final words, um, Renee, any final sort of tips of, and encouragement for our viewers here today? Yeah, I just think it's a great time at the moment as we're all kind of transforming to the new normal or whatever that is, just to think differently um, and think creatively, think authentically, um, because from every disaster are opportunities. So whilst, you know, many of us are struggling with um, what's happening, there are opportunities and there'll be change in the horizon. Fantastic. And Linda, for you? I might just leave everyone with my favourite quote for the moment, which is from Helen Keller, which says, the bend in the road is not the end of the road, unless you fail to make the turn. So I'd be encouraging everyone to make that turn, to adapt and go after those new opportunities. Fantastic, excellent, great, great final tips there. Some beautiful comments coming back in here. Thank you, loved hearing all the examples. I think we nearly had up to about 20 examples today of different organisations, <laughs> lots of questions and examples. Richard said he's enjoyed hearing of all the aspects of planning, establishing, maintaining partnerships. Um, thank you so much for all your comments coming in there. Um, thank you so much for being here today on the show. Again, we're here with you over the next couple of months. Thanks to our partners at Equity Trustees for getting behind this initiative and helping make this free for everyone across Australia. Great work and thank you, says Richard. 
Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Linda. Um, it's wonderful having a collective. I get to hang out with all of these amazing, wonderful people and great having you on the show here today. Thank you for sharing your knowledge so freely with us all. Um, I'm going to wrap it up there. Thank you to tech support. Thank you to Jack in the background helping us with tech support and the whole team and the community at the X Factor Collective for helping make this happen. Um, I'm going to wish you farewell. Um, stay safe, stay well, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon on the show. All the best.